This is the Cop Think Podcast, where we answer the question, why do the police do what they do? I'm the host, Brian Casey. My guest is Bruce Sokolov. 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 How do I say it? Well, you're very close. Sokolov. I, I felt it's like very I, good. I beat it up a bit. No, you didn't beat it up. Some people, uh, you also go by Sock. Nobody calls me by my given name. Even the bad guys in Metro Detroit call me Sock. So do the judges. Yeah. <laughs> and you go by Coach Sock, too. Everybody calls me Coach Sock. All right. Yeah. Um, I think maybe your expertise, one short phrase would be uh, field training. Um, I think... Uh, A way to jazz that up a little more would be talking about working with new cops, young cops, people that mentor or train or guide cops. Uh, Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Um, Everybody refers to what we do as field training officer. We refer to it as master police coach because we take a very different approach, a coaching model to field training as opposed to a, a more traditional model where they probationers graded, marked, and scored. Our our belief is is that uh, these men and women are young, but they're not dumb. They don't need grades. They don't need marks. They need guidance. So we turn the field training experience to an ongoing uh, training process all during the shift. Hmm. So yeah. help us understand it a little bit. What, uh, how do you describe it? Can you describe it some more? Sure. Uh, typically, um, in field training, the probationer is assessed, evaluated on a daily observation report, which conventionally can have anywhere from 28 to 36 dimensions of performance review, generally on a uh, one to seven uh, force rating scale. So we've displaced and replaced that with 10 dimensional categories that are generic to law enforcement, the US and Canada, most English speaking nations. And instead of grading, marking, and scoring, we assess on a scale which is uh, meet standards, yes, meet standards, no, corrective action necessary, and exceed standards. When the probationer is consistently meeting standards, yes, then they've earned exceed standard uh, benchmark. Uh, so we turn the DOR into a inner uh, uh, kind of a uh, interoperative uh, piece of game film. So when the probation is done, whether it's captured on dash cam, body worn camera, or whatever, we have an opportunity to review. We upload it to the digital DOR and we debrief with that. And, and really, Brian, it focuses on three questions. The first question the FTO is going to ask the probationer is okay. On that traffic stop that you just cleared, on that uh, landlord tenant that you just intermediated, whatever, what did you do correctly or approximately correct? So we have the probation reflectively take a look at what they did correctly or approximately correct. They take full ownership for that. The second question is, all right, if we could wave the magic wand and deja vu redo what was just done, what would we do differently? So the shift in the personal pronoun, they own it when they've done it correctly or approximately correct. When there's an area for redirect, the FTO, master coach, and the probationer own that. So keep in mind, the probationer would have never been allowed to do anything unless that uh, master coach had properly prepared them with the applicable training tasks, policy, procedure, general order, state statute, appellate court decision, or whatever. And they have been well scrimmaged before game day, which means a lot of simulations, a lot of role plays, a lot of problem solving, decision making for strategic thinking. Um, The bottom line is there's no setup here. So the probationer is not going in blind. They have been very well coached to do. So now they just did. And so that second question is reflective on, all right, let's compare what was done versus how we were trained to do and really compel the probationer on a problem solve. You cherry pick it. You tell me the areas that we need to redirect and correct. Once a probationer's done that, the third and the final question is, why should we be concerned about this? And the focus on that is to ensure that the probationer fully recognizes the consequences of what he or she did or didn't do. And then we go forward from there. So it's a very interactive the, uh, model. The probationer always knows where they stand all during the shift, not just at the end of the shift. And, um, you know, a coach is somebody that prepares people to play to win. And as a 40-plus year cop, I can tell you that second place is a first-place loser for the street cops in any jurisdiction. 
So we've got to play to win. Yeah. Wow. And then how did you, how did this evolve? Did this, um, this, this is very different than now uh, um, having a cop go out there with a senior cop and then the senior cop uh, watch, waiting for him to fail and berate him. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's, it's more proactive. I mean, look, uh, you can't make assumptions. You don't want any setups and you don't want to surprise the probationer. If you drop back from that, that's an acronym for ASK. And I don't want a master coach to be an ass. I want them to be a mentor, a teacher, a trainer, a coach, a role model to ensure. Now, we can properly prepare the probation to do. Whether or not he or she ultimately does, well, it's on them. What did uh, what was your experience 40-some years ago? Oh, my God. I mean, what was your no. – there were World War II vets and Korea War vets as cops when you came out? Yeah, on? there were still – we didn't have the 20 and out in Michigan, so there were more than a handful of um, World War II guys, lots of Korea guys, and lots of the early Vietnam guys. Kind of interesting, uh, my class was the largest class in the history of the department, uh, typically, you know, as a department of under 200, they would bring in maybe, you know, 10, 12 people. There were 28 of us, including uh, the first group of female police officers that were deployed to the street. Um, they were not police women, even back in 1970. They were police officers, and their uniforms did not look like flight attendants. They were tailored for the street. So it was pretty exciting uh, that we hit the streets with uh, a lot of uh, gals that were really pioneers uh, in uniform patrol policing. And uh, quite honestly, there was no field training. Uh, when we came out of the academy, you went directly to a downtown beat. You walked a beat on afternoons or days or if you were really un lucky midnights, which was not a good time because we got out in the middle of uh, February. It was very cold and snowy. And guess who draw? drew uh, midnights? I did. <laughs> so it was it was one of those experiences where you're learning by trial and error by the seat of your pants. And that's not a very good model. Yeah. What, yeah. So that was in Michigan? Yeah. 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 In 1970. 19... Ann Arbor, Michigan. Wow. And yeah. You know, when you when we prepared for this, you referred to yourself as a geezer cop a couple of times. <laughs> well, I am. I'm usually the oldest cop in the room. When, for example, I, I I've got 36 uh, over at Richfield PD this week in the class, and I, I am by far the oldest fossil cop in the room. I feel like I'm a coordinator at daycare. I look at some of these cops and I go, "Come here." Does your mom know you have a gun? I need to see a driver's license, I, you know. And I asked one of the kids this morning, one of the young cops, I said, uh, when's the last time you get carded? And he turned all red. I said, it was yesterday, wasn't it? He goes, yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I've seen a few generations. Yeah, yeah. you have. What um, You were kind of apologetic about it, though. It's I see. You know, <laughs> maybe you're making mocking yourself maybe a little bit, but... What, do you, what is this? What does your generation of geezer cops have to teach the younger generation? I think that uh, the most important thing you do is don't do all the talking. Be an active listener. It's a communication is just as critical to actively listen and hear what people are trying to tell you, uh, without being presumptive and jumping the gun. You're talking about uh, when you make a contact on the street. Okay. That's number one. Number two, the mantra is. Always leave people in better shape than when you found them at the top of the contact, whatever it takes. Uh, most people are in distress. Um, they don't want to have to call the cops, or they didn't call the cops, but the cops are there. So that's an issue, sure. You know, you say that, that just seems like an obvious statement. Most people are in distress, and we sometimes maybe we forget that because we're not necessarily in distress. We're maybe relaxed. We're doing the job we do. Sure. But everybody we're dealing with is upset, distracted. Um, yeah. Well, you think about it. In, in first responder service, everybody's happy when EMT, CMS roll, uh, when there's a need. Everybody's happy when the uh, firefighters uh, show up when there's a need. Most people aren't that happy when cops show up. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're not always the most welcome folks in somebody's life. And you have to, you have to go in uh, socially and consciously aware of that. Well, how have you seen policing evolve? evolve? Oh, golly. Um, I, I will tell you that the, the one takeaway, my generation, 
is I think we were closer to the people on our beats. Uh, we had an opportunity to be statically assigned in the district, a sector, a patrol beat, whatever. So you got to know not only the pulse of the beat, what was right, what's not so right, but more importantly, you got to know the players in the beat. And they got to know you. You were their cop, basically. And, you know, everybody has a different level of need. So uh, you were wearing a lot of different hats. You were like the Swiss Army knife. Uh, one second you're a peacekeeper. The next minute you're a law enforcement, uh, law enforcement agent. The next minute you're a social service broker. Uh, sometimes you're trying to do an intervention. How, how are you going to keep uh, the old couple uh, from uh, dying in the cold because there are rears on their uh, power and light bill? So what do we have to do to call out some markers to make sure that we get into a fund and make sure that they don't freeze it down? So it, 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 you've got to be quick on your feet. You've got to be very adaptive to the uh, beat that you're serving. But again, I mean, you're out there to serve the beat, not your own self-interest. Yeah. And I think that we've gotten a little bit away from that. Uh, I can tell you by the time I left uh, with uh, the computerization over the top, everything CAD driven, um, the call for service volume uh, amping. Keep in mind, Brian, we did not have 911 in 1970. So the call for service volume was a fraction of what it is today. Cops had job security, but it wasn't as crazy over the top as it is today. And I can tell you by the time I left, the average squad would be rolling six, seven, eight calls over to the oncoming unit uh, in sector just simply because they couldn't catch their runs uh, during that, uh, that tour. So it's a hit, it, it's a quick in and out and go. I, I don't think we have quite the decompression time that we had back in the day to really chat with folks. I agree. And it's, it's the, what you said, calls for service, the uh, expectation that cops run from one end of town to another, yeah. um, the amount, the pure share volume of calls, um, the added work for some, for each call sometimes. I, I talked to some officers the other day that uh, one had been injured, the other one had had a special assignment for a while, and then they were going back to the street and they were just dreading catching up on all the technology that they had missed out on. Yeah. And these were street cops. Oh, sure. No, I get that. And one of the things in the master coach curriculum, particularly for the supervisors and the street bosses, is that nobody is going to be deployed back to the street who's been absent for the street for X amount of time or longer. Most departments in this country, in Canada, it's about six months, 180 days, regardless of what the nature is. Uh, you know, what, what is what is six months, 180 days? Well, uh, for a reorientation specialist to be reassigned to that returning personnel, and I don't care if they're coming back from family leave or surgery recovery or whatever, uh, even coming out of a special assignment you come from the gang squad back to uniform well you're doing the job but you're not making house calls and things shift out there the technology whatever whether it's the software the hardware just the policy and procedure uh, procedural criminal law statutes uh, change as well so I don't want to send uh, that cop back out to the street blind I want them to have a wing person and that's a master police coach with them and it's not a glorified ride along. We have specific uh, training tasks that we need to fill a gap. Gaps are general areas of performance standard. So what the agency does prudently is they sit back and they go, okay, when did they leave the street? When did they leave the uniform? So we got that date locked in. What's your estimated date of return to uniform patrol? We get that date locked in. And between those uh, two poles, we fill in literally the gaps general areas of performance standard, what's changed? So they don't have to figure it out by trial and error. Nobody wants to look or feel like a goof out there. So we put a master police coach back on board with them to, to ease them through the transition to play catch up with those training tasks and the standards. How do agencies do without this? Not very well, I would guess. Not very well. I think all of us have been a byproduct of um, thrown back into the fire. Well, you'll figure it out. You're a cop. Well, it doesn't work that way. I mean, the job is so fast-paced, so, uh, so technology overload, that it's imbecilic to expect the average cop to come back and be quick enough on their feet to be able to process the call for service, uh, clear the runs, and really without compromising anything out there. So. We can't have compromised police service delivery. 
that master coach has got to be a top cop. And a lot of times the bosses will say, well, what's a top cop? And I said, well, think about it for a second. You can't take somebody someplace you yourself have never been, and you sure as hey can't give away that which you don't possess. But more critically, not only do you know what you're doing, you've got the ability to communicate, and you've got the patience of Job, because everybody learns at a different rate and pace, doesn't make anybody more or less intelligent, makes us uniquely human and wired differently. So it, it takes a very special individual to fit that role and do it exceptionally well. Yeah. How, how long have you been doing this part of your career, this training? Oh, gosh, I, training? I started uh, training FTOs uh, before we called them master coaches in 1981. I'm really impressed by what you're doing, um, and I'm grateful for it. And what I like about it, too, is doesn't this invigorate the... Um, the FTO as well, obviously, yeah. Yeah. Um, because you think about people in their career needing to be reinvigorated, or, you know, think more about why they do what they do. Um, so this really asks a lot of them. Sure. And, you know, I, I'll take that up a notch. Um, back in my day, which is hardly uh, possible today, in order to bid master coach, you had to have five years boots to the street uniform patrol. You had to be exceptionally vetted and, and not cocky, but comfortable in what you're doing. And then go through the testing batteries to get into the field training unit. Um, I was lucky. Most of our FTOs had well in excess of five. Most of our FTOs were somewhere between eight and 12 years to the job. and. Predominantly, these were men and women that weren't looking for stripes, bars, or stars. They weren't on promotional path. They didn't want that. But they wanted something that was a little bit more job enlargement, job enrichment. And they were great cops, so they gravitated to the field training unit. You know, Brian, what's really interesting is even the new blue, the kids that just came out of post right off the college campus, no prior police experience, They'd be out on the street with that master coach. And at the end of the shift, that master coach would come up and say, hey, boss, uh, you got a minute? I go, got all the time in the world. What's up? They go, I don't know who the hell's getting more out of this detail. Mm -hmm. Me or the new blue. Every day this kid is lighting me up and showing me something that I should know. I probably knew, but I got complacent and haven't done. So I say, well, you know, there's an old Latin expression, qui das it dies it. They who teach learn, and I think learners from learners learn from learners. So it's a it's a uh, a good relationship where one hand washes the other. So it's great for the probationers, and it's awesome for the senior cops. It keeps them uh, on their toes. It really does. Oh, I can easily see that. Yeah. See, the first I don't know how I ended up coming in contact with you, but I ended up on an email list where you send out emails on a lot of topics, often. They relate to mental health and well-being of officers. Um, you know, in matter of fact, I use it like a study group. I mean, I never make comments. I just read the articles that you send out or the comments about the other people in that email group. Yeah. The reason I bring that up is it's like a study group for me. It's like a uh, like a, a, a mental health and well-being study group. How how did you get interested in that topic? Well, it was really easy. Uh, my side job, my second job, is as deputy chairperson of a 5013C uh, organization called the Badge of Life. And our primary mission is police wellness and suicide uh, prevention abatement. And so as a board member, I looked at our board, which is pretty eclectic and awesome from all across the U.S., and I also have assembled quite a Quite, quite a list of what I call the cop docs and those that ought to be cop docs that are wearing uniforms. And you certainly qualify, Brian. Uh, there's no question. I saw you when I saw your book come out. And the minute I got my hands wrapped around the book, I go, oh my God, this guy's a St. Paul Blue. I've got to reach out to him. I've got to make a contact here. Mm -hmm. And we did. And um, I'm glad we did it with ser serendipitous in so many regards. But uh, that's how you got into that group. If you look real hard at that group, that the emails. You'll find that we've got uh, Ian Hescott, 
from the British Police College in London. Yeah, I've met uh, him. You, you know, Ian, he's a super guy. We got Pete Collins, who is the chief shrink for Ontario Provincial Police, O Canada. Uh, we got a lot of Canadians, a lot of U.S. and Brits, a couple of Aussies in there. Uh, we've got a lot of cop docs, Dr. Kevin Gilmartin, Dr. Ellen Kirschman, uh, Dr. Jack Digliani, uh, who has just joined uh, Batch of Life as one of our advisors for the peer support team training. So we couldn't be uh, happier to have you on that distribution. Yeah, but you know, well I keep my mouth because I know the company I'm in. I just want to hear what they have to say. But oh. it, it's very impressive. And I'm really grateful for it. Um, your name comes up. Uh, in my email list, and I always look at it, and Thank I you. always look at what you have to say, and I always look at the article. I often will forward it to my work address and where I can spend more time or put it in a file and stuff. But it's it's really helping me feel current on a lot of topics. Plus, to have these people you mentioned making other comments. So yeah. I don't want to I don't want other people to try to get in on this email list. But I'm grateful to be on it. Tell tell us a little bit more about a uh, badge of life. A batch of life in the old days, and I say the old days up to about uh, a year and a half ago, was in the business of trying to count and validate suicides. Dr. John Fialati, who is probably the premier suicidologist uh, in Copland, uh, is still one of our major advisors, and he's the guy that would that. But, you know, Brian, most of the statistics that we get are incidental. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no mandatory reporting, A, uh, by anybody, uh, it, it should be uh, the CDC, National Institute of Mental Health, whatever. The Department of Justice just announced that uh, they're going to start uh, capturing statistics, but it's not mandatory. And because it's not mandatory, uh, those figures are pigs in space out there. We do not have an accurate handle. But you know what the real problem is? It's great to count numbers, but what does that tell you? There is no after action review to dip into the uh, what I call the post uh, uh, psychological autopsy, if you will. Mm -hmm. now, I, I give you a great example. Um, when we rebranded Batch of Life to stop counting numbers and start getting into a proactive uh, department wellness training, the city of Chicago Police Department incurred six death before shift all on duty in a seven month period. Uh, two sergeants in four slick sleeves and the profile was identical. Clear the roll call, get out in your squad, death by suicide. And we looked at that and we go, this is not an anomaly. Something is definitely wrong with this picture. But everybody's just capturing numbers. Nobody's looking at, well, what are the causational factors? What do we have in common here? You know. Were there issues, uh, substance abuse? Was it relationship falling apart? Uh, was it financial difficulty? Was it a whole cornucopia of things? What the heck compelled them to do what they did? And as a result, uh, we rebranded because we reached out to Chicago PD proactively and said, look, you got a problem. And they said, tell us something we don't know. I said, Let's tell you something that you should be doing that you're not doing, and that's proactively, really cutting through uh, the dung and going right down to the shift level, ensuring that the team supervisors are aware of signs, symptoms, when something isn't right, early warning intervention, if you will, and be very proactive with it uh, to ensure that there's roll call training for everybody. The biggest single issue, and you know this, is a cop boss and a, as a vetted uh, person in this business, the biggest single problem we've had to overcome is the stigma issue. Cops are scared right down to the quick. These men and women that would go through a hot door on a shots fired in a heartbeat are immobilized with what I call the Hershey squirt, just thinking about admitting I might have a problem, you know. I, I don't feel so good. And that's okay. It's, it's, it's normal, okay, not to feel good. But it's incumbent that you do something about it. And therein lies the problem. Not every department has an infrastructure of a lot of uh, service deliveries because one size doesn't fit all. You know, what we found in Chicago was 
they have a historic and well-vetted uh, chaplain's unit. Father Dan Brandt has been the tip of the spear there. But my goodness, they've got every faith represented. And these are the God Squad guys that get out there in uniform on the street. Most of the cops feel a lot more comfortable with the chaplain unit than they do on a referral to an employee assistance program because there, there's so much latent paranoia. Well, if I go to EAP, I know it's supposed to be confidential. And I get the HIPAA thing, but the bosses are going to know. And I'm one step away from the rubber gun, gun squad. This could be a career ender for me, and I don't want that to happen. So a lot of cops don't follow through with the resource that, that is there. I think your neck of the woods, peer uh, support teams, is the absolute best way because when a cop's not feeling so hot, who's the best person to speak with? A cop that's been there, seen it, and done it. So I think it's incumbent for organizations to have an excellent and very well-trained cadre of peer support team officers. And the important thing about that is, as you know, they know their limits. When they get to a point with that cop that's in distress, they know exactly how to gently point them in the direction of the follow-up services that they're going to need, uh, whether it be a clinician, whether it be a therapist, whatever. So the I think take, the, the takeaway, the, the core, takeaway. The core message amongst peer support is, brother, sister, you're not alone. And one of the things that um, they can also do is, one, one benefit of peer support is that they're also on the factory floor with these folks. So they also notice these changes and, and uh, notice when people are sure. so-called not themselves or struggling or troubled and such. These are teammates. We know these men and women. And, and we know instinctively when everything's okay and something isn't okay because uh, you can't con a con. I've never met a cop that wasn't a 24 karat con. So you can, you can try to be a bull crapper, but at the end of the day, I know you. And I know that something isn't right. Come on, let's talk about it. What, what do you got to say? It's just from your lips to my ears. Let's just chat it out here a little bit. And, and that's a great intervention just to start and find out, hey, uh, you're not the only one. Uh, one, of the, one of the programs that we endorse at Badge of Life is a program that is relatively new to the streets and beats and is going national, international. And it's called We Never Walk Alone. And um, the hot link uh, to that website is also on my website, www.algoresworldwideweb, uh, policefieldtraining.com. But it's also on the Badge of Life uh, website, uh, badgeoflife.org. Uh, so the hot link is there, and it's so awesome because what we did, cops don't steal, they appropriate. We took a look at what the Brits were doing, and the Brits have got an awesome uh, app called Backup Buddy. And it's spectacular because any cop with uh, a smartphone can dial into that app and take a look and find another cop that's very similar to them. For example, you just came through a really bad experience on a, uh, on a iOS. Um, I, want, I want a peer support guy that's lived that life. I, I want a peer support guy like uh, Sean Riley at Safe Call Now, who's so far down, he couldn't see up. I mean, abused every substance known to human and, and chemists. And, and so that's the type of guy that I want to be talking with. This app uh, that we created with, uh, with uh, We Never Walk Alone is just that. Right at the fingertips, it puts you in touch with that peer support person who's probably best fit because here's what, the other thing. Yeah, we walk to factory floor, we turn out a roll call together, but sometimes uh, cops are reticent to even uh, reach out to their own in the house who are really well vetted and squared away as peer support. So maybe that cop in Portland, Oregon Police uh, Bureau would feel a little bit more comfortable talking with that cop in Portland, Maine uh, Police Department. So we try to provide some options. Uh, look, the bottom line is, is to roll back up. You know what I know. When a cop's in distress out on the street, they don't have to ask for the backup. Units are rolling in that direction. But why is it when a cop is in distress? Well, we turn the other way. 
Well, that's a personal issue. I, I, I shouldn't be intrusive. So if they don't ask, I'm not going to pro-offer. And that culture has to shift. We, we, we've got to look out for each other out there. Well said. Really well said. Um, yeah, I, we have to go as far as impose ourselves on people. It's, it's difficult, and it's, it can be frightening. But um, uh, the people are relying on us. Our coworkers are relying on us. Sometimes I wonder if cops are like, why, aren't, why isn't anybody noticing I'm leaking out all over? And how come no one's responding? Yeah. And, and I think uh, uh, that's particularly peer to peer, not just uh, slick sleeves, the boss on the shift, the watch commanders or whomever. And, and that has to change, too. It's not intrusive. Uh, like I say, it's OK not to feel OK. And everybody does at some point. But you got to do something about it. It's incumbent that you take uh, control. And, and sometimes people don't see the need to do that. So sometimes people that know these people ought to say, hey, Brian, something's not right. You know, I don't want to be intrusive, but this is what I see. And it's specific, it's objective, and it's descriptive. It's not my opinion here. This is what I see. It's off the bubble. Uh, I was making some notes on what you said. Um, you, you know, we have a mantra at Badge of Life. And it's a very simple mantra, and it sounds like this. No more broken cops, no more broken cop families. And, and that's another part of the puzzle that needs to be filled in. It is incumbent. I believe when you hire a cop, you're hiring the entire family. And we shouldn't be a dysfunctional family. So how do we engage the family into our culture and our support network? You know, th think about it. You've, you've got a officer involved shooting, and you know what a nightmare storm that produces, not just for the cop, but the family around that cop. It's not the same. And so who also needs some rolling backup? Well, certainly the partner, the kids, whatever. Uh, they're not in a bubble. They're not immune. They watch the TV. They see it uh, in the papers. They hear it from their friends at school, whatever. So, you know, how do you provide that level of inoculation for the family? And how do you roll the backup appropriate to the family? So let's, I want to, um, let me do a quick commercial and then I want to come back to something. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, uh, field training. And then we talked a bit about your interest in what you're, and those that are contrib contributing to a, maybe a deeper healthier understanding of psychological trauma and risk of suicide and mental health issues. Um, I'll do a quick commercial, and then I kind of want to come back to how you view the, the cops that are coming out now. What are the, um, tell us a little bit about what you're seeing about the, the next generation of cops. Uh, before we end, if you enjoyed this podcast, you may be interested in, in the book that Sock mentioned. That's Good Cop, Good Cop, um, a Get Healthy, Stay Healthy Guide for Law Enforcement. I cover a lot of topics in that, uh, some of the things that we're, we're speaking about today and some others as well. You can purchase this book at, on Amazon. You can also find out more information um, uh, about the book or Blue Watch training or this podcast at goodcopgoodcop.com. So Brian, I, I'm going to supplement that commercial to tell you that you were the very first book that we placed on our website, Police Field Training. Uh, dot com. And that was a featured book. And I take that book out on the road with me every single week. And I say, all right, here's the deal. If you read one book, and I hope you read a whole lot more than one book this year, it's got to be this book. Hmm. There's no cycle babble. It's straight up right from the street. And it's a how to, not just for the department, but for you and all the things that you have to do to keep the, the cookies in the jar and the cheese on the crackers. So uh, we're blessed to have this book out there, Brian. You've well, given us uh, quite a gift. Well, that's really nice of you to say that. And uh, I owe a, a lot of thanks to my wife, Terry, here, who uh, we spent three years on it writing. And um, plus the, cool, the cover is a cool-looking cover, too. It is a very cool-looking cover. It's yeah. a, kind of like a gang tattoo cover. <laughs> <laughs> so what... Um, what you tell me a little bit about what you're seeing uh, coming out there on the street now and some of the, what are you seeing about new cops? 
uh, more good than a lot of the bashing that you get from yeah. some folks going, oh, these millennials are whiners. They feel that they're entitled, whatever. And I don't see that. Uh, what I see, of course, every generation a little bit different. We're all different based on our circumstances. When we grew up, where, how, our education, socioeconomics notwithstanding. But, you know, Brian, one of the things that I've noticed, and I saw the shift about six, seven years ago, is that we've got more cops coming into the job where their moms and dads were very transparent and willing to get into therapy when things weren't right. So I, I think that we're bringing a generation in that isn't as uh, pushed back on uh, seeking the help that you need when you need it and, and going outside the confines of the department to find it. Yeah, so I'm not without hope. I'm, I, I'm seeing that as well. Uh, yeah. their, their willingness and matter of fact about therapeutic help and that type of such, that type of thing. You know, I'll tell you something that I noticed the other day. I was... Um, I do a thing where I follow up on traumatic events because a lot of those, you know, we know what critical incidents are. Most agencies don't miss a critical incident, but in law enforcement, um, since traumatic events are so personalized, I just call them bad calls and individualized. Sometimes we miss them. And one of the things that, that I do or our peer support team do is, is phone follow up with those folks. And maybe I'll do a podcast on that sometime because it's a, a system that works pretty well. But I, um, was asked to follow up with some officers, and uh, and it was an infant death. And, and then I thought, well, you know, I'll look at the body cam just to get a sense of what this call was like. So I'm, I'm watching the body cam video, and I'm thinking, I couldn't admire these cops more. Yeah. These were young cops just watching how they rushed to the scene, ran in the house, and artfully applied their craft in this really tragic situation. And then, of course, I could follow up with them on the phone, but... I. And then I was even talking to a couple other patrol bosses, and I said that to them. I said, you know, I, some of these new cops, I just find them so really skilled and admirable. And, and they said, these two patrol bosses said, we were just saying that to ourselves last night. I almost wonder sometimes if, because I know agencies are struggling with the fact that less people are applying to be police officers, but maybe those that are applying some of those, you know, are really committed to the job because they kind of know, maybe maybe know a little bit more what they might be getting into, or it's, or know that there is some negativity around it, and they're like, doesn't matter. I I have a sense of why I want to do what this job, you know. Yeah, I think uh, more of the no notion that it's a calling, not just a job; it's a profession. And those two street bosses that we're talking about, their troops that uh, rolled on that uh, infant death. I hope that, hey, that at some point, not too long down the road, as soon as practically possible, they reach back to these troops and say, okay, listen, looked at the BWC, looked at the images and everything else. I want to tell you guys, you handled that socially aware, mega intelligent, and you left the, detrut, the distraught adults on scene in a better place as a result of it. Well, it was well done. Let's broadcast that right now because we should, anyone that's listening that, that, that has some influence over these new cops or supervises them, yeah. some of these cops out there all across the nation are doing remarkably good work under very trying circumstances. Feedback is a breakfast of champion. You know that. You're a street boss, Brian. You understand it. I walk into cop shops. I'm one end of the map of this country to the other end every year. And, you know, you've got a relationship with the cops and the cop houses. You walk in after a classroom day, after 16, 30 hours, an afternoon shift is booting up, hitting the street, whatever. And you ask the street bosses, how's business? How are you guys doing? And I always ask, uh, the guys that are, are doing above and beyond, do you reach out and let them know? And you know what I hear? It breaks my heart. Well, What's this touchy feel? Social work, for God's sakes, they're just doing what we pay them to do. And I go, no, no. Feedback is a breakfast of champions. You think about it. How pumped do you feel when somebody gets right into your space and says, hey, Brian, on that SIDS that you had the other night, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. I got to tell you, well done. Absolutely well done. Thanks for being in the moment and leaving those folks in a better place in a very terrible set of circumstances. 
you're making a difference. And I appreciate you being on my platoon and my team. Well, I like how you said that. And, and when I do have these conversations with these officers on the traumatic follow-up calls, um, I genuinely thank them for doing the work, being out there at night or whatever time of day. I'm really grateful that they're out willing to take these difficult calls and do this difficult work and do it well. What else, um, what else are you hoping we might talk about? What, what did I skip? Well, I want to hear where you see it going in this new decade. Uh, you've been around the shop. You've been around this business. You've been around the police mental health uh, business and wellness business. So where do you see it going, Brian? Where do I see the mental health stuff yeah, going? Yeah, if you could wave the magic wand, what would you like to see in the next five, ten years? Mm. What would I like to see? I would... I would like to, to focus on um, protective factors, why cops do well, uh, what are the things that strengthen them. What are the, I'd like to have cops spend some time thinking about their higher purpose and function so that they can have, you know, so they can have a greater sense of meaning and purpose uh, when they do difficult things. Um, the stigma thing, I my take on that is um, I I do this deal where I kind of pretend it doesn't exist. Not that I don't recognize it. I just don't like to focus on it so much and make bring it into the conversation so much. I like to just talk about how um, how much I admire the cops that come forward and how in the in the span of a career and arc of a lifetime. People are going to struggle with things. These things are often unavoidable, and some are absolutely necessary to maturing as a man or a woman. So, um, so the messaging I think would I'd like I'd like to stay focused on. Um, I guess they call it health realization or positive psychology or uh, those type of terms where we focus on where we want people to to end up. Um, when I came to the job. I was very fortunate. I, there were old timers, and, and they had the old sage advice. It wasn't anything like it is today. But one of the old timers that uh, kind of informally mentored me out on the beat uh, was a cop that still had the Irish boat broke off the boat uh, from Ireland. His name was Bill Dempsey. And uh, Bill would uh, pull me aside and say, lad, we need to talk. We deal with people problems every day. Don't forget to deal with the own issues that can haunt you. So he was saying way back in the day, hey, no shame. And you're not going to find that on a bar stool at the end of the tavern. So be careful out here. Yeah. So let's see. Um, if people want to know more about you or what you do, can you give us one more time uh, where people can find I'd you? I'd be happy to. Um, the best place to find me parked is on my website, which is www.policefieldtraining.com. And um, your website is right in there, Brian. You know that. And, and I encourage people. I say, look, um, leaders are readers. And whether you're slick sleeve, whether you got three stripes, whether you got butter bars, uh, stars, eagles, whatever, get in there, start reading. And so one of the goals I ask the cops is, I go, what's your reading goal every day? And they go, say what? I said, what's your reading goal? What, what are you reading? Are you taking any time to read? Are you taking any time to take time for you to build your career? And you're not gonna do that unless you read. So we try to push them into uh, the website to start kicking the tires and take a look. You could get lost in there for months. but uh, I'm glad you brought up the reading things. I want to mention something about that is um, I'm basically a non-reader, I call myself, because I had a reading disability or whatever on diagnosis as a kid, and I ended up writing a book with 50,000 words in it um, with, with no pictures, unfortunately. And, um, one cartoon. One cartoon, yeah. yeah. Um, it cost $400 to rent it. The... the um, um, but when I, when I think about reading, I'm a very slow reader and uh, a pretty poor speller as well. 
So when it comes to reading, I just am more of a meditative reader, which I mean is I don't read very much very fast, but I will read a page or two of whatever book I'm reading. I'm almost always reading a book. I just read 1776 the, about the Revolutionary War. And it took months for me to finish it, but I read a couple pages and I ponder it. So, so don't be in a big hurry. Don't feel like you have to fly through it. So, so what if a book takes you time? Because I know some officers aren't big readers. So, You know, that's okay, too. Because a lot of books are audio books, and you're putting your book over to an audio book. So that could be any better for the folks that say, eh, reading, not so much. I'm going to fall asleep by the third or fourth page. I'm tired to begin with. I can't stay focused. I've reread the last page three times. I'm not sure what it means mm -hmm. anymore the third time. But you, you pop that audio book, you go off for your walk, you go off for your run, you're just driving to work, whatever. What's the takeaway? Mm -hmm. My goodness, it, 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 it is just as effective as reading the gosh darn book because you're getting the information. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a lot more entertaining. Right. Yeah. I agree. Well, thank you very much for a couple things. One, for that uh, email list you had me on and being my kind of guide on staying current on a top bunch of topics and the opinions of people that uh, have something to say on these topics. Thank you for doing the work you do and for having this thing evolve, um, what you described made a lot of sense. It sounds very powerful. And um, anything else that I should thank you for? Uh, I'll tell you what, um, the journey is not over. You and I have got a lot more work to do. And so you keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to be doing what I'm doing. And somewhere in the middle, we're going to help people out here along the way. Because it's not about us. It's something much larger than us. It's honest work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Brian. Thank you.